Thanks for this opportunity because smart city is a topic we have been uh, uh, trying to connect to the air quality for a while. Um, uh, I work as a, uh, as a scientist at, at NILU and I have also a function as a manager of the European Topic Center for Air, Transport, Noise and Industry, which is a collaboration with the European Environment Agency. And I am saying that because the Environment Agency is providing actually quite a lot of information about air quality and uh, I think it is a relatively good, well-kept secret when that is uh, said. I will of course be talking about air quality and um, I will first take you through how good is actually the air quality right now. How did we get to this point? Uh, and I will talk a little bit about what do we know about how does the public think. And then I will see if I can give you some, some information about how the public, uh, uh, if, if the public can actually get involved and in what way and what are the challenges with that. Uh, hopefully with some idea how to continue. Uh, in uh, 2017, uh, the EEA, together with a number of other organizations, have launched this air quality index. So you can see this one of the first days of the index being online. Uh, this is actually quite a composite product. It is based on something we call up-to-date data or UTD data, which are data not fully quality controlled data passed from the monitoring station in stations in Europe. And it is combined with a quite a sophisticated system of models to produce this, this map. If you look, how does it look like today? So this is the, a picture I just downloaded right now. And you can see that we have some issues uh, with air quality uh, right now. In Europe, uh, still, we have exceedances of particulate matter uh, and nitrogen uh, dioxide or nitrogen oxides. In addition, we have some problems with the ozone, mostly in the, in the southern areas and uh, southern Italy and France. So we have really not solved all the issues quite yet. Uh, we can also, we have also some estimates of how much does it cost. So it's not only health uh, that we cost, but it's mostly health. And in 2012, you can uh, say from these numbers that uh, the costs across Europe to E27 is uh, roughly three times or twice the uh, national budget of the Czech Republic. So the costs are still quite substantial. We had a number of very uh, good developments. This is one of them, not the only one, but this is the concentration of lead in in uh, in the air and how is it, and in Norwegian mosses. In Norway, we carry out the survey of mosses every five years, and you can see that after the ban of of uh, lead in petrol, the situation in Norway can visibly be seen uh, as a real huge improvement. Similar improvement you would see, for example, in acidification of lakes. And if you look at how people are exposed, you can see this does not go far enough back. And that is because we only started collecting data on, on uh, that are relevant to exposure and data in cities in around the year 2000 when the European directives uh, came in place. But you can see that for, for most uh, most compounds, the exposure has uh, decreased, but not for all. Uh, when you look at the history of European air quality, so you can say that we have been systematically working on it uh, uh, throughout from the 70s or, or late 60s. The first uh, issue we tackled on a European level was the acid rain, and uh, that is uh, when the first conventions came in place. And they are, of course, they have been a major success with uh, rather a lot of uh, emission reductions and and uh, they have influenced significantly the European legislation. Uh, the first protocols from the convention came around 1980s and they 
uh, they aware of about regional air pollution, but at, the, at that time we also started to work towards improvement of local and urban air. And we also um, have uh, been receiving first numbers uh, or first data about persistent organic pollutants and their effect. Uh, on uh, human health and the health of uh, uh, animals, for example, most famous were the polar bears, which are of course eating uh, are a top predator. So they they eat up everything that has accumulated in the in the food chain, and they there was a lot of contamination with reproductive effect throughout the 90s. The directives on air quality have been prepared, and then they came into effect in the year 2000. And they, uh, among others, uh, made um, made requirements how and where and when to monitor air quality in cities. At the same time we started uh, Antarctic monitoring. Uh, Europe has actually several stations in the Antarctic looking mostly at greenhouse gases but not only. And this is the time where the integrated assessments really got their boom. And of course uh, uh, nowadays uh, we have new technologies uh, that are maybe perhaps uh, can be considered uh, rather disruptive technologies as far as air quality monitoring goes because until now we have been developing reference instrumentation we have been basing ourselves on very high quality but very uh, very few measurements now we have a possibility to have very many measurements of unknown quality, but ubiquitous. They can be everywhere. And sometimes people talk about democratization of, of air quality. I'm not quite sure I agree with that, but anyway. So uh, during this time, we have developed a system of uh, management or governance of air quality that consists of uh, three elements. It is uh, the air quality directives that regulate the concentrations of pollutants in the air and every, every member state uh, uh, transposes them into their own legislation. And then we have two types of legislation that is affecting sources. This is the National Emission Ceiling Directive, uh, which is looking increasingly at more and more sources, and this is very closely connected to the protocols from the UNEC. And then we have a number of source-specific em emission reduction directives, such as for large power plants, medium power plants. We have eco-design directive. We have directives on eco-efficiency. We have fuel standards and a number of other, other instruments. So in this way, all these three uh, types of instruments are contributing to improvement on air quality. And as you saw, we, they actually led to an improvement. But if you look at the at uh, if this is enough, then that is an argument that uh, actually we can uh, we can discuss. On the left hand side, this is from 2017, but I don't think there is a major change uh, since then. Uh, in 2017, this picture was part in the of the e, one of the EA reports, and it shows that as far as European legislation goes. Uh, we still are not fully in compliance, but the situation is not too too good everywhere. But when we look at the WHO guidelines, which are based on scientific evidence only, then we can see that the guidelines are stricter and that we are far from being in compliance. So there is a movement now towards sharpening the European legislation uh, towards uh, providing better protection to human health and uh, being closer to the WHO guidelines. So to summarize this, we have had quite a lot of improvements, but the health, we can argue, can, is not still protected quite yet. What happens if we ask people, and the Eurobarometer is actually quite a great instrument in my opinion, and there was a special Eurobarometer on environment, and people were asked what do they think if the, among other things, over the last 10 years, and this is 2017, has the air quality improved in where they are? And you can see that most people actually, despite the, the objective fact that the air quality has improved, most people don't think so. So 
in a way, uh, we are in a situation, we have the official system that is perfectly quality ensured. There is a lot of procedures, uh, very good measurements with good precision, good, uh, good, uh, good uh, specificity. But uh, people don't feel that there has been any progress in the last 10 years. And they don't feel that actually they have any information. Again, this is an older Eurobarometer for 2013, but I don't think we have a newer figure. How informed do you feel about air quality problems in, in your country? And most people don't really feel very, very well informed. And that is despite the fact that, that uh, the air quality directive from the start has a requirement to inform the public. And uh, when you ask, in, uh, for example, in Oslo, we have asked people um, about um, uh, what do they know about the air quality and is it uh, what they know is, is the information useful to them. And again, most people, there is not very, that's about half of people who think it's mostly useful, but about half who are kind of not so convinced. And this is despite the fact that air quality, uh, actually air quality portals have been available for a while and air quality warnings are available to the municipalities and there is a lot of information available to the municipalities and to the public about the sources of pollution and their effects. So there is definitely something to be desired and that is, uh, I guess, why these new technologies that are coming around 2012, you can see here uh, that the timeline down here starts uh, starts in around 2012 and, and these so-called low-cost sensors for air quality, which are relevant for smart cities, they came around the year 2010 and they have been uh, modified from from work environment most of them and they are targeting ambient levels of air quality which is a big challenge still today because the ambient levels are in fact rather low so uh, we have been working with this and working with the public on how to use this uh, since the 2012 we had a number of projects that were funded from the european research and now late, nowadays we have a quite large norwegian projects together with municipalities like where we are helping municipalities or working together with municipalities in order to make them uh, make them mm, um, to enable them to use these new technologies in, uh, in a useful way. So uh, if you look today, there is a lot of uh, different activities. Uh, maybe the most well known is the Luftdaten.info. Luftdaten is, a, is a, um, a, basically an NGO in Germany that provides quite a lot of sensor data coming into their portal from those sensors. They target particulate matter. Uh, and uh, it is quite interesting because you can really do your sensor yourself and connect it to the system and it will become a, a dot on the, on the map. And for example, if you look here uh, in Bulgaria, these data are actually because in Bulgaria there are only four monitoring stations for urban air quality and there is, I don't know if there is probably one or two IMEP background stations, so there is not really much available information on air quality, but people have these sensors and, for example, doctors are using those sensors for impact assessment. And that is a problem because we don't really know how the sensors work. So we are using one technology for a purpose that it wasn't really designed for. Uh, another such system is the Purple Air. That's again a particulate matter sensor you can buy from the US. Costs about, I don't know, 200 uh, US dollars. And what happens is that you install your sensor and then you, then you connect it to the Purple Air server and Purple Air could provide you with this map. And today this is quite an old map. There are many more Purple Air sensors nowadays. You can zoom in, you can see your data, all that is available. 
what we have been doing, well, we have been trying to see if we can use the sensors uh, for something to enhance the information we provide on air quality. And we had, you can see on this map here, we had a number of sensors across Oslo. And we have combined the results from these sensors with the other air quality information we have in a way so that they give reasonable contribution. And this is one day in Oslo uh, where you can see the main roads and the morning and afternoon rushes. So in a way, uh, you can, uh, the sensors, because they provide you information on uh, very high temporal resolution, you can put them everywhere. So you can actually get uh, information from them that enhances the information you already have. So if uh, you look at what information do we have about air quality today, so we are able to harvest up-to-date data this is again open data and they provide information about near real time. Problem from the point of view of quality control is that they are not fully quality controlled, but they can be accessed by the public. We have excellent quality control data uh, from the reference stations that says, say something about the historical situations. And this is of course for, for research purposes for, and for any other users and it provides a baseline. Then today, something I haven't talked about is that we have actually quite a sophisticated system in many places for short-term predictions of air quality. Usually those are either on a national level or on a local level. And they, those predictions are today often used as a basis uh, for informing the public. You might have noticed that on Euronews there is actually uh, information about air quality and that is based on this kind of short-term prediction. Uh, and we are able to model, uh, model air quality. But again, uh, we, uh, we uh, generate this information as a combination of all the sources, so not only measurements by reference stations, but we also today have uh, quite a lot of satellites that provide some information about their quality. We have a combination of models and a lot of different types of models for different purposes. And we also have a number of fora where these things are being developed. So, so you can say that today the problem really is not the lack of information. We have a lot of information, the information is very good. But the question is, are we able to tell uh, about it to somebody who like the public, for example. One important thing is that these technologies, you have always to consider if they are fit for purpose. What do you want to do? And if there is a legal requirement or not, and the technology or the solution you want to use, does it actually fit in with this requirement? So there is a lot of work being done on assessment of the performance of the, of the sensors. And if you look here, this is for a PM sensor. This is an article from 2019. And it shows that with uh, higher relative humidity, the sensor is not so uh, providing good data. So for like relative humidity over 80%, the particulate matter sensor, this particular one is not really providing very good information and this we are gaining more and more of such information and the sensor providers are improving their operation and and generally there is movement towards better uh, better hardware but still it's not uh, it's not always a good thing and whenever you want to use a sensor technology you need actually to look into the parameters of what of the outputs well, where does it leave us in terms of governance of air quality? We have this quite clear legislation and policy system that uh, actually is to be uh, uh, to be implemented on local level, but we have quite clear subsidiarity and who does what. But if we will ask the public, they still think that the air pollution, this is again 2017, that the air pollution is important. And, but then the question is, where should it be handled? And you can see that the EU level is the preferred uh, place. And it is a good question. What do people actually mean by that? Is it legislation or is it measures? Uh, 
Uh, and then uh, if you ask, this is from Oslo, uh, what, who people think should take care of the air quality, only very few think and people should do anything themselves, but it's mostly the authorities or the industry. Here, the municipality, if it was not the first, they could have more than one choice and this is just the first choice. Okay, so I don't know how many set municipality at all, but you can see that that uh, that it's overwhelmingly not I who, sh as a citizen, who should do something about this. And if you ask people how should they actually be involved, uh, some even say that they should not be involved. Some say that it's through voting in the election or in a referendum. And most say that it's kind of like a discussion issue or, or not, which is not really very heartening. When you look at what municipalities say, and this is a project from the, that was funded by the Environment Agency and there is a report about it. There have municipalities even today have quite a lot of challenges when they want to implement air quality measures, public opposition being one of those challenges. So the question is, if we give people sensors, will we, have, will we help the situation? Will there be less opposition? And the solutions that we are trying to find, find out in Norway is exactly this kind of thing. If we develop some kind of co-monitoring with the citizens, does it, does it actually help? Problem is that this is a technically rather difficult system to set up. If you buy one sensor uh, and you buy it from Purple Air, you can see your data. Now imagine you buy 10 sensors, you will have to see 10 different web pages, right? So if you are a municipality, how are you going to handle that? So you have a problem that you actually need to, to get the data in, uh, see them under in one system, get them out, get them quality controlled, because as a municipality you cannot just, uh, just do what you want. You have legal obligations and by all means you should not misinform people. And not having good information is, is a very good uh, road towards misinformation. Today, then, I see it like that, that if you are a municipality or any authority, uh, in fact, uh, you have in relation to air quality and new technologies, you have three types of challenges. First, of course, uh, relates to the picture I just showed in the previous slide how are we going to actually use the new technologies? Can we support citizens to provide their own data to our system? And how, when they have done that, what do we do with those data? And how do we relate the data to the citizens? Because we now know that one sensor actually is not really a good, good thing. But if you have a network of sensors, we know that this actually provides pretty good information. But how do you get from the single sensor to the network is uh, still a bit of a research question. Then again, if you are a municipality and you want to, for example, procure systems, procure uh, by a number of, of uh, sensors, you will have to write a specification for that. How are you going to do that? We have now worked with six municipalities in, in Norway. Took us one year to work together with them to come up with a tender for, for sensors, right? So this is not, as, not an unsubstantial challenge because if you do the tender, uh, tender wrong, then uh, you end up in a useless situation for yourself. Well, these are technical and technological challenges that can be handled. Uh, one challenge that I don't think we are particularly good at handling is actually, okay, so now you have connected your citizens, you have asked them, so how is that going to change your, your system, your operation? How? Because as you know, working with citizens is tricky. If they feel that you have asked and then done nothing, then you have a problem. So, in my opinion, the technological challenges is something we are working on. On procurement, there have been a number of places that successfully did that. So, there is a lot of, not perhaps not a lot, but there is information. But on governance, there, I believe, is the place where we actually have to work more. Thank you very much. <laughs>